Okay, today I will talk about the reliability gap in uh, uh, deep learning for uh, robotic perception. Uh, but first, I will motivate, motivate the, why I'm interested in this, in this topic. Um, I will give an example of a few projects uh, where we deployed deep learning on robots. And then I will talk about the gap, identifying uh, uh, what came out of these projects as a, as a insight. And then I will talk about the research we are, talk, we are working on currently uh, in, this, in this area. Thanks. Yeah. Good. So we, we are few, okay, good. Ah, that's it. So just to give you a little bit background about myself, I'm interested in uh, uh, enabling mobile robots to operate in challenging environments, environments that are complex, populated, uh, changing uh, over time, and agriculture is part of uh, such environment. Um, I am with the Australian Center for Robotic Vision. Uh, so we are, we do, uh, it's, a, it's a big center with uh, four universities around Australia, and we focus research on uh, computer vision uh, for robotics, or we call it as it is, it's robotic, robotic vision. So again, why I'm interested? Uh, because of these three projects. Um, the, fir the first project is about uh, deploying deep learning on uh, agricultural robotics. Uh, robot, uh, what's called Agbot, Agbot 2. Um, for this audience, I don't uh, think I need to give uh, this kind of background, but um, um, it's, it's, it's the problem of herbicide resistance in Australia. Um, one solution is to be more precision, uh, use a more precise treatment where you can know, uh, you can distinguish between the weeds and you can use um, uh, targeted uh, treatment for each of these kind of weeds. It can be mechanical weeding, microwave, or maybe you still need to use the chemical. Done uh, manually, it's uh, very uh, uh, time consuming. Agricultural robotics can help. Uh, so this project was uh, a PhD uh, thesis. Uh, to make it more interesting from a scientific uh, aspect, uh, we thought about it in, uh, in a way, it's unsupervised weed scouting. So what, what we, we mean by that, what's the objective? Uh, before you arrive to the, you don't need to have a, a classifier running or trained already before you arrive at the field. You can get at the field, deploy, deploy the robot around, collect the data, label the data, and build your classifier for that particular field. So it's a field specific uh, deep learning model uh, trained on the field. The problem here is you will still have to ask this farmer for, uh, to label data, and they hate that, and I hate that as well. So how do you do that? Uh, how you do that in a much faster way? Uh, so there's the first stage where you send the robot around. Um, detecting greens in the fallow, fallow period, so the fallow period is where the, 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 the farm is left alone, but there's, you, you, don't, you need to keep it clean. Uh, so here, we, 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 want, we don't want any plant, any weed uh, to grow uh, during this period. So we send the robot around to detect uh, images of green, and we know how to do that. Uh, there's the, first, the first part of uh, surveying the field is okay. You can go collect the images. Any, any, green, you, any green plant you can find, you can uh, select, and then you need to do uh, selective data labeling. There's no need to label all the data. If you can group the images uh, in, a, uh, in a similar sub, sub or must, uh, major clusters of plants. So if we can, if we can get from, if, if the field have five different weeds, it can be a grass-like weed or broadleaf weed, uh, we, we know how to distinguish between them in an unsupervised manner. So this is just the, the stage of detecting green in the field. There's no need to use deep learning here. We know how to do this um, using the color spaces. Uh, however, uh, you still need to, we still need to cluster uh, the similar looking weed in unsupervised manner. For that, we use deep learning, and this is where deep learning was deployed in this project. Uh, we use something, if you are familiar with the, with the literature, we use something called Bottleneck layer, uh, for it's just uh, describing the, the images of the weed um, in a smaller uh, vector. 
And then we ask the algorithm to cluster them uh, in major clusters. So until now, there's no intervention from the farmer. And then we select in, inside each cluster a sub, sub uh, or a representatives of uh, the weeds. We ask the farmer to label them and we can propagate the labels back into the clusters uh, to find, uh, to give labels to this, uh, to, to this, this plants. Uh, what's cool about doing robotics uh, agriculture, as you know, in the field, that you, you don't get just to, to collect your data, you blunt the data, um, because you need to control the experiment, so you need to blunt the weeds to start with. Um, uh, so, after you finish, we talk to the farmers in Australia, and they say, okay, how, how good it is? So we can use some of the metrics from machine learning, we can use precision, we can use recall, but really it doesn't, for them, what matter is this robot should not miss any weed in the field because if you miss, it will regrow and it's like you, you didn't achieve much. Um, so for this particular application, not missing, you need to, you, your recall need to be 100%. You, need, you should not miss any, uh, any blunt in the, in the field. Okay, so this is the first, the first uh, project. The second project is um, an interesting one, which I, I have very uh, fun time working on. It's an underwater uh, robot. It's called Cotspot. And this robot task is to help in saving the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia is dying from multiple reasons. One of them um, is something called the crown thorn starfish. Uh, this is uh, a best which is it's eating the, uh, the, uh, the coral. It's responsible for the destruction with the hurricane of over 50% of the, the reef, or the 50% the of the destruction happening of the, on the reef is because of these uh, bests. They, there's many reasons why they are uh, multiplying in a very, very uh, large numbers. There's no uh, predators, uh, and uh, the runoff from the farms might be the, the reason for their uh, spread. How it's being done currently is these divers, I met a few of them uh, when I was on the reef, and uh, they just dive and search for it, and then when they find one, they inject it. And you go, and there's hundreds of thousands of them, and the reef is huge. So one way to help is to have robots, which is a force multiplier. What I mean by that? Um, this robot doesn't need to find all the crown thorn starfish. It, it, it can find the easy one on the, on the, in the area and detect and inject with the same, um, the same as the dry, diver. And then the hard ones, they are hidden somewhere there. Uh, the divers will come and just pick them up. Um, so I did this in 2015. Uh, all the processing power should have been inside the tube, the yellow tube, on that board, uh, and it need to be uh, deep learning because the classic methods didn't work. Um, I was resistant at the beginning, that's not everything is deep learning, but at the end of the day, uh, this is what worked, and it did, it did the job, and it had to work in uh, 10 hertz. This is uh, on, on my machine, uh, just running the algorithm, uh, searching for the cuts, and it will find it and uh, it can, the robot can uh, do the injection afterwards. For this robot, it's different from the weed uh, scouting robot. For this robot, it's okay not to get all the crown thorn starfish, but it's very, very bad to misclassify something as crown thorn starfish because you will inject. So uh, I always remember this meeting where they gave me this paper where you have to sign legal document that if you, <laughs> if you inject anything else, you are liable because you are, you are doing the opposite of what you, what you should do. So this robot is different. The, 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 the requirement for this robot is different from the first one. Okay, the third, the third project is in horticulture and it was about uh, the objective is to uh, yield estimation. You just uh, want to detect the, the fruits. Uh, 
And uh, you, you, you might have guessed it already. We did it using deep learning. Uh, everybody is doing it uh, using this, this tool. Um, it, it, does, it does the job. We went for uh, green peppers. Here in this image, there are six green peppers. Can you see them? It's, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a very difficult task. You might ask, okay, how do you go about this? Maybe you use multiple modalities. Multiple modalities might, might help the algorithm uh, to detect uh, the green or the hidden, uh, the hidden fruits. Uh, so for this project, which is uh, the paper called Deep, Deep Fruits, it's a popular paper currently in the, in the literature, uh, we, we uh, used uh, RGB and near-infrared. We studied uh, fusing this uh, modality early on, so in, in, uh, uh, in the network, uh, or later on. We, we did the multiple experiments, and we find that late, later, uh, if you fuse the, the information, you get better classification. But what's important here in this, in this case is this, this robot, if the robot is uh, for yield estimation, it's okay to miss, it's okay to uh, false, to get it some, sometimes uh, wrong, as long as there's a balance. So you see the, the, the requirement is different again uh, for, this, for this robot. For in robotics, every application will have different evaluation criteria, and usually we use these criteria from computer vision uh, community. For us in robotics, if you think about it a little bit, they are useless, meaningless. Why? Because they are calculated based on a held out subset of the data with the assumption that this uh, uh, data uh, set for test will represent all possible conditions the robot will face in the future. And I'm giving you a number, a number on this data set which say, okay, this data set will represent all the conditions the robot will, will face in the farm, rainy condition, fog, whatever, all of these data, all of these conditions, this number, this data set represent that. And this is not right. The, in, our, in, 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 in robotics, um, the condition change and it's not easy to collect data that represent all possible uh, future conditions. This one thing. The other thing, which about uh, accuracy, because all of these uh, metrics has also problems uh, in their own, but I like to pick, uh, pick on uh, accuracy because I, I think it's a fun, it's a fun one. So let's let's see because I come from Australia. Let's let's have this robot uh, on uh, which has a deep learning model on a car, and the job is to detect kangaroos. Kangaroos in Australia always jump in front of you uh, in the car. Uh, so let's assume I'm building this. I collected 10,000 images. Uh, inside these 10,000 images, there's only because it's rare to find uh, a kangaroo in the middle of the road before you hit it. So let's assume we have 100 images of kangaroos in front of us in the, in the, in the, car, in the road. And we test our detector. This detector, from the 100 images, detected only five correctly. And, uh, and wrongly detected 150 kangaroo from the rest, which there's there's, there's no kangaroos, but the detector says, okay, this is, there's a kangaroo. So notice, only five from the 100, and it made 150 wrong. And if you calculate the accuracy, it's 97%. So this is what's called in, uh, in machine learning uh, the accuracy paradox. A model with low protective power can have higher accuracy than a, a one with higher protective power. So accuracy, be careful with it. Uh, if you don't, if you have an, um, the, the two classes are not balanced, uh, you can get very unrealistic numbers. It's useless. Okay, so what to do now? The each each uh, robot uh, or its application has its own uh, criteria. The metrics are available already. We, we really we should be careful when we use them. One way I'm thinking about it currently is to look at the reliability for phys phys physical assets. And some of you here uh, may be familiar with this. So reliability for physical assets says, let's ensure that the asset 
perform their inherited uh, functions without failure for the required time uh, duration when installed correctly, operated correctly, and in a specific environment, specified environment. So this is the definition of reliability for physical assets. And the link to physical assets will come in a few slides. Uh, so I can, I can go back to, 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 yeah, you might ask yourself why, why uh, he's talking about physical assets uh, when we are talking about uh, softwares. Uh, so in reliability for physical assets, there's multiple concepts and uh, practices. There's the reliability centered maintenance where you do the maintenance to prevent uh, the, uh, the fault from happening uh, by uh, an anticipating uh, the fault and uh, trying to do the maintenance in a way to reduce the fault. There's other one concept called reliability, availability, and minability. Here you are uh, talking about the uptime and the downtime and the frequency of the, the errors, the faults in the, in the, in the asset. Uh, failure modes and the effect and the criticality uh, analysis. Um, here we are uh, talking, uh, asking question about, uh, so this physical asset, this sensor might, if, if it fail, what, what might be the reasons uh, for it to fail? There's the failure mode is a way something can fail and uh, there's, there's many, uh, many, uh, many ways uh, one thing can fail. So uh, you can do the analysis. Live data analysis here, you are uh, talking about what's the probability of failure after a particular time uh, when this asset is, uh, is deployed. And root cause analysis, which is very important, is when things ha go wrong, you still need to explain. So this is about uh, when things are not, uh, ha when a fault happened, uh, this, uh, this analysis will explain to you why, uh, what, what went wrong. Okay, so let's step back and look at these practices and see what, what they really mean. Reliability in essence is the practice of reducing the likelihood of fault or failure. So you can do this by failure prevention. The first one is with the maintainers. Failure detection, where you already know how things can go wrong so you can detect the, or you measure some of the uh, indicators of, of the that a failure happened. Failure prediction, you can use data uh, available, a live, live data analysis and, and uh, the, the, the RAM uh, analysis to, uh, to predict when this asset can uh, or will fail. And failure explanation is uh, when failure happened, you need, you need to explain uh, what went wrong. Okay, so what I will do now um, is I will look at machine learning for robotic perception as a smart sensor. For us, it makes sense. We want to use it on the robot for perception to obstacle detection or weed, uh, weed detection or um, segmentation or vegetation following. Uh, so for us, it's really a smart sensor. It, it, there's an equivalent to a, uh, to a physical asset here. So the problem here with deep learning is, uh, or machine learning, it, it fundamentally lacks the framework uh, to reason about failure. So if I just switch uh, the word in the definition of reliability to take machine learning instead of uh, uh, physical assets to ensure that a machine learning model or a deep learning model perform its intended function without failure for the required time, duration, when installed correctly, operated correctly, and in a specified environment. Just to be on the, on the same page, I will repeat why, why, I'm using, why I'm using this parallel between uh, deep learning and uh, physical asset, because as I said, for us, we have these sensors feeding data to multiple uh, deep learning models, and these deep learning models doing semantic labeling, geometric estimation, motion prediction. So the parallel makes sense. So again, to be on the same uh, page with the audience, uh, I will talk a lot about development period and deployment period. In robotics, uh, we might start with something already trained. So this, the, the development period already uh, done by somebody else. Uh, maybe we, uh, we use fine-tuning, we collect our own data, 
Uh, and then at the end of the day, what we really care about is the, the deployment period where I want to plug and forget. I wanted you to, to do the job. So you have a, a new input coming in, uh, and our trained model will do predictions. Okay, so go back, let's go back to the, uh, the definition and just look more in more details. Let's see what's, what can we get out of it. Okay, so the machine learning uh, here uh, should perform its intended function without failure. When, so when installed correctly, this is your model related to the model. When operated correctly, this is, I, will, I will relate that to the data. And in a specified environment, that's for the deployment environment, where you are using your uh, robot, uh, and uh, consequently, you are using the deep, deep learning model in that environment. So from data, what's, what might cause the failures uh, for these models from a data, data point of view? Uh, sometimes our training data, we really, we really underestimate sometimes in robotics how much data you need to train a model. Uh, so you, your training data might be inadequate. Sometimes the, the input is corrupt. The, uh, the sensor is, is just, some, there's something wrong there, there's noise, which you didn't account for. In the environment, um, sometimes you, you are training for a particular environment and deploying in different environment, and you're assuming it should work. Uh, it, 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 will, it, will, it will not work because there's a shift in the domain. Sometimes the domain itself uh, shifts under, under us. Uh, from the model point of view, the model assumptions sometimes uh, can be broken. Uh, I will talk about closed close set and open set conditions, which is a really serious uh, issue in robotics. And uh, the model uh, fragility, uh, where a little bit of change in the input will give you a different output. And this is now, I think you heard about this multiple, from multiple people. The, okay, let's go back to the projects I was working on. Uh, in that project, my job was to create a data set to, de to detect uh, the crown thorn starfish. So I was working very hard on labeling the data, but early on in the project, I wasn't focusing on what is not the target, the negative set. If your negative set is, 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 not, is not good, uh, you, 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 there's a cause of pro problem there. But if you think about it a little bit, what is the negative set here? The negative set is everything else. It's a huge. It's a, so one, one day I was, I was in, the, in my office and uh, I pointed the camera on top, on the ceiling for, by, wrong, by mistake, and the model was running. And this is, was very, very, uh, detected a very, in a very high score as a, star, a crown thorn starfish. You can, it's, because this has never been in the, in the training data and the test data. But uh, the model think there's, there's some structure there. But it think it is a crown thorn starfish. Okay, you can say to me, you will never see a ceiling in the ocean. But this is just to make, to, make the, to make the point. In robotics, there's also a capture bias. Uh, we train our models on images collected from the internet, where people took the images, where the object is in the middle of the scene, very nice lighting conditions, um, like very, very, uh, we, we would like to take, to take good, good photos. And on your robot, on the robotics application, you don't get that. It's the very rubbish kind of uh, input to the model, so you need to account for that. And it's not easy to do it, to do in, in, the robotic, in a robotic application. Uh, other cause is uh, damaged sensor or bad visibility for some, this, this models will get an, take an, an input from you and will give you a prediction, it's fine. Uh, the prediction might be wrong, but they, they, don't, they can't tell that the input is wrong or the input, there's a problem in the input. So you can uh, have the cause of this problem from, from the source of the data coming to the model. Uh, okay. This is a, a, mo a model uh, trained to detect cars. Uh, on a publicly available uh, training uh, data online. I took that and then I tested it on a sequence of images taken from uh, a publicly available, another publicly available data set 
uh, where a car is moving in the city. And uh, it didn't work well, it didn't perform well. You have, uh, the red is the false positives, where there's car detect, where it's detecting cars where there's no cars. And the blue is where there's a car, but the, the detector failed to detect that car. Okay, if you take this and you plot the performance over time, hmm, this is what you see, this is reality. The reality here is the performance of the deep learning model fluctuate as you go in the, in the environment. It's very, very, very powerful insight when you think about it because in computer vision, uh, they describe the performance of an algorithm by one number. Um, the mean average precision, or uh, well, the area under the curve, but in robotics, that's not valid. The, the performance will change based on the conditions. Uh, if the conditions suit the model, uh, the performance will be good. If it doesn't, it will fluctuate. And you have problems when it dip down, uh, and that's very high risk, and uh, the safety will be, uh, will be in question. Again, the one causes of the, the, the fault of the errors is uh, the environment itself, when you deploy, let's assume you have a, 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 robotics, uh, a robot in a, in, a, in a field, and the field itself is dynamic. It's changing all the time. So the, the condition is changing as you, so as, you, as, you, as you go. You might collect data from the first day to make it suitable for this environment, but the environment will not stay the same. And is it possible to account for all possible future changes uh, in one, in one from, the, from the beginning? Uh, this is a big question. Uh, fragility here, uh, you can see the detection. It's a knife, it's a cell phone. Uh, as I move the, uh, it's a knife now, it's a scissor, scissor now. So this, these models uh, change predictions uh, very, uh, very quickly uh, as you change the input a little bit. Uh, this is just me to make the point. Uh, maybe you can come back and say, okay, you can build some, something on top of the model to make it better, but the reality is they are fragile. They change the, their prediction uh, with a very small change in the, in the input. Okay, so let's go back to our reliability uh, for, for deep learning and the parallel with the, uh, with the physical assets. So we need to do failure prevention, we need failure detection, we need failure prediction, and we need failure explanation. There's already research happening in these areas. So the first one, first one is safety verification for deep learning, robustness to data set shift. People are talking about this, and there's uh, work on, on this. Uh, for failure detection, we have uh, uh, meaningful work on producing meaningful uncertainty. So you can detect a f uh, failure when the model tell you, this is my prediction, but I'm not sure about it. So here, that's a clue that there, there might be a, a problem there. And the open set classification and out of uh, category detection. When you, when you train your classifier to detect 1,000 objects, you are assuming during deployment, you will only get examples from these 1,000 objects. That's not true. You will get many, many other obje objects from other classes. And um, your classifier is trained to give you a prediction of one of these 1,000. Um, people now will say others as a, as a, as a category, so 1,001, uh, and you say it's others, something else. But others is really everything else in the universe, which is not, not, not easy to, to model. And for failure prediction, we have out of distribution detection, uh, when something arrives and you are not familiar with. Uh, learning with rejection, the, the classifier could say, I don't want to make a prediction. Uh, I I'm not familiar with the input. False negative alarm system as well, uh, where you have a real-time monitoring, monitoring for the performance of the detector. Something else monitoring this, this module and say, uh, okay, you have a dip in the, in the performance or not. So in the, the one which uh, I under, uh, underline is the, the research we are doing in my group. Uh, but before I, I touch on that, uh, I will talk about safety verification. So what does it mean to, to, do, to have a, a, a safety uh, in deep learning? What, what safety mean in deep learning? 
or for these models, it's the invariance of the classification prediction uh, within a small uh, neighborhood of the original image. If I take an image for uh, an apple and I do some perturbation or some changes to it, uh, if, if, it's the, if the changes is not severe, the prediction should didn't change. And you can start asking question, how, how big is this area around, around the original image? Um, and then you can say something about the uh, the uh, reliability of the classific classification system based of how big this area. Uh, the other one, the other research currently in the literature, and I will encourage everybody to read the, uh, the paper I cited on the slide, is um, robustness to data set shift. So when you test on one data set, you get the, your numbers, and then if you go and test on another data set, which being created to have the same statistics as the one you tested originally. So here they are using ImageNet. So they went to the ImageNet uh, test uh, data set and they asked other people to label a new set of images and follow the same statistics uh, of the test set of ImageNet. And they tested multiple deep learning models and they found that there's drop on 14% 40, for, uh, drop in performance. This is a really big problem in robotics for us. Because if you, if you get what, what, what they did here, they tried to build an identical test set. Uh, not identical in the mean of the same images, but the same statistics, and they still have the drop in the performance. So this is need to be, uh, we, we, in robotics we should ask, or we should, we should be interested in this uh, thing, because it can ha harm or cause uh, catastrophic uh, problems later. So, my team in, uh, in QUT, in Queensland University of Technology, uh, Dimity and uh, Maruf, uh, both of them are uh, doing PhD, their PhD thesis about this, this topic. Uh, Dimity is on object uh, detection, uh, and uh, Maruf is on false uh, alarm uh, system. Both of them are working on uh, generating meaningful uncertainty from these models. Me uh, uncertainties are useful for robotics because it enables the robot to abstain from prediction uh, or taking action. I don't know, or this, is, uh, this situation is not familiar for me. Uh, delicate, high-risk uh, action to humans. Uh, the conditions are not uh, favorable for me to do autonomous uh, behavior, so it will hand it to the human, or ask the human for annotating more data. So I mentioned open set and closed set many times. Some of you might be familiar with, for, for people who are not familiar, um, you train on a particular data set with 100, for example, 100 or 1,000 non-classes, and you test on a test data set, but using the same 100 uh, non-classes, and you get your number, and uh, that's closed set conditions. Robots rarely work in closed set conditions, rarely. In open set conditions, you train on a training data set which assume that re represent the reality uh, as you will see it uh, during deployment, and you, when you test, you are deploying on the robot. Uh, and what, what, is the, what is the evaluation? How do we evaluate that? Uh, as I said, the numbers currently uh, for us in robotics doesn't mean much. Uh, the, the other line of research is false negative alarm system where um, the argument here is, okay, you can push the performance uh, as hard as you can to get a better results and better results, but you will never get a perfect uh, model, perfect classifier. Alternatively, what you can do is you can build a monitoring system which can monitor the reliability performance of, the, of your model and maybe sound an alarm uh, when, uh, if, you go back to, if I go back to the fluctuation of the performance, if you can detect this fluctuation, you can, you can raise the alarm and say, okay, the conditions are not, not uh, not good. So this is uh, one paper we published uh, in 2018 about uh, how to uh, get a better uh, spatial uncertainty from, uh, from object detection. The idea here is you detect an object, but you, can, you might be uncertain about where it is in the image. Uh, so that's a spatial uncertainty, and you can be uncertain about its label, that's semantic uncertainty. And the paper, to, if you want to check it, is down on the slide. The other paper as well from 2019 presented in IROS uh, this year is about uh, our early work on 
uh, false alarm system uh, where we, where we monitor, monitor um, uh, traffic sign det uh, detection uh, system and we raise an alarm when we think or when we detect that the, uh, the object detection system is missing, misdetecting objects. It's a harder problem than if you do uh, detect an object and you say it's different label. It's different from, uh, from that problem. It's a really hard, it's a really hard problem. Okay, so uh, I hope I uh, give you an interesting, I gave an interesting talk and uh, uh, this is, uh, I will end up with mentioning our robots. Uh, so we have the har uh, robo harvesting robot, Harvey, the cold spot I talked about. Uh, in 2017, we won the Amazon uh, Baking Challenge with our Cartman robot and uh, you saw the egg bot uh, in the slide. And thank you very much, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions, but I'm not sure that we have a microphone. No, but uh, you can uh, ask uh, very loud the question, and I will repeat. Uh, do you have any question? Yeah. Um, we're working on an AI-based system for surveillance of the robot for uh, prohibiting crash with humans, and one of the systems we look into is using different types of uh, neural networks or deep learning algorithms. Yeah. yeah, so this is a, a classic uh, method in uh, increasing the reliability of sensors where you use multiple sensors and you, you, you judge based on the agreement between them. And I think this is the first step somebody should, you should take uh, this as the first step because it's, it's powerful. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, you can, you can you, it's, not, it's not currently clear what's the best alternative. Uh, so you, you notice we, we borrowed that from a, from currently, uh, from, from how, we, how they handle uh, current sensors by adding redundancy. Uh, one note about what you mentioned is usually the sensors need to be identical to get you, uh, so if you use multi different kind of models, um, I don't think you can get uh, a meaningful, uh, uh, inf uh, meaningful uh, prediction about the reliability of the sensor. Yes. And then, and then using different sensors as well as another layer. Yeah, yeah, that's one. Yes, for us, for us, we are use, users of, of, uh, of the models. We, we are end users. We, d we take them, we deploy them in our robotic system. Uh, making, making more research in, in, this, in these models for robotics makes sense for us. Uh, and it, it, it might be one way to, to improve, improve them for robotics because uh, many of the problems I mentioned, they, in the computer vision community, they don't really care about it. Um, it's, it's not something they, uh, they think about. Uh, but in our community, uh, this is ma central ideas. So, yeah. So this is um, another technique which is related to multiple sensors. So you are doing, you are doing, you are taking multiple predictions over multiple frames as if you have multiple sensors doing the same on the same frame. Uh, so it's a, it's a similar framework, yes, we do that. Uh, that's what, we, what I did for the uh, Crown Thor Starfish as well. One of the advantages of either robotics could be uh, the internet of things. You can have multiple sensors uh, around the field. Uh, do you see an interest in combining all of these perceptions? Yeah. So in, in robotics, we have real time, we need to do real, uh, actions in real time. And maybe the latency might, might be an issue. If it's not an issue, you have more, uh, more, uh, more processing. But most of the time, we need to uh, avoid obstacles very quickly. Uh, so you need onboard processing.
I, can you repeat? I didn't get the first part. Uh, How did you reduce uh, the, the image you needed? Yeah. The labeling need for, uh, for the farmer. Uh, I don't have the numbers, but I think it was 23%, uh, if I, I recall, um, the needed for, for the farmer to, to label. So it's a trade-off, yeah? The, so it's better to give you as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a curve. So they label more, they get more accuracy. Less label, less accuracy. And then you will ask the farmer, where are you happy, where the, the accuracy, which accuracy you are happy with. Um, that research is not ready to go in the farm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an early work. Uh, but you will, you, in any application, you will always have the trade-off. Uh, there's, there's no, no perfect uh, classifica, uh, classification system. OK, uh, we have uh, the time for just the last short question. No more questions? <laughs> okay, perfect. So we respect perfect is the time. Thank you again.